Hey, let's talk about Animal Crossing. Now, if you've clicked on this video, presumably you know what Animal Crossing is. But for those who haven't played it, Animal Crossing is a life sim series where you move to a new place and do... stuff. Also, everyone around you is a giant talking animal and the entire world's economy revolves around this single dad. By the way, yes, I do know that Timmy and Tommy are technically Nook's apprentices and not related to him by blood, but he's the only parental figure they have and they call themselves Nooklings, so it's functionally the same. Just go with me on this one, okay? You'll have plenty more of my opinions to comment on later. Long story short, it had been eight years since the latest Animal Crossing title, New Leaf on the 3DS. Don't even with that. New Leaf was regarded by most as the best entry in the series to date and the most original in a long time. Anticipation was high and expectations were even higher. New Horizons sold like hotcakes. Like crazy hotcakes. Like hotcakes that were filled with ice cream and served with a free puppy. This was of course because Animal Crossing had a huge fan base that had been waiting, plus it was releasing for the Nintendo Switch. It also happened to release in March of 2020, the same month that Shelter in Place started across the US, so it felt like a nice island getaway for a lot of people. This was the most popular game in the world, and it wasn't close. Please remember to like, subscribe, comment, or even share if you enjoy this video. It helps me out tremendously and allows me to get these out more frequently. The next vid will also be more meaty, and it's one I've been looking forward to making for a long time, so stick around for that. So, what's the game like? Well, for starters, this was the first time Animal Crossing had been in high definition, so they had to do a lot to adjust the art style. The game's graphics are a bit jarring at first, with the high poly models of these low detail characters and environments, but it doesn't take long to get used to, and it looks nice overall. I only started playing the game about two months ago, and it definitely hooks you in as you'd expect from any Animal Crossing title. The first few days of the game are very objective-based, as you're helping Tom Nook prepare the island and unlocking some features along the way. This section also seems to serve as a tutorial for the game, but the majority of what it's teaching you is Look, you can put furniture outside now! The premise and relatively new setting are pretty exciting at first, but the further you get into the game, the more familiar it starts to feel. As you develop more and more of the island, it starts to resemble every Animal Crossing town that came before it and stops feeling fresh pretty fast. And it's kind of a conundrum because things like the Able Sisters shop and the museum are staples of the series, and a lot of people would miss them if they weren't in the game. I certainly don't blame the developers for taking this kind of familiar route because it's tried and true, and there are so many small mechanics and visual updates that they had to get just right, and for the most part they did. But on the other hand, it feels like a squandered opportunity to create something new, create something with a different flavor. That being said, the basic gameplay loop is still about as fun as you'd hope it would be. Now, if we're discussing how well this game works as a sequel, we need to compare it to the older Animal Crossing titles, i.e. the original Wild World and City Folk, and consider how very little difference there was amongst these titles. Like, literally the opening portions of the first three Animal Crossing games are exactly the same. As in getting to town, Nook waiting outside your house to make you work for him, and him assigning you exactly the same list of tasks. I mean, it's precisely the same. Like, it feels like a middle school student getting all their research paper information from Wikipedia and just switching out a few of the words so the teacher can't call it plagiarism. Overall, there's more difference between the original and Wild World, making lots of little tweaks and improvements to the original game's formula while also being portable as it was now on the DS. But City Folk honestly felt like a straight up port of Wild World. The graphics felt exactly the same, the gameplay loop is identical if not even more bland, and it's now on the Wii so you can't even take it around with you. Like even all the music is the same, come on man. It added the little shopping area you could go to, which they somehow got away with telling us was a city, but it was so unsubstantial. Hardly ever worth the bus ride and loading time to get over there. New Leaf really got the ball rolling and switched up the game's formula by having you be the mayor, adding some fun quirks and giving you control to make bigger decisions around the town. Relative to the previous titles, this game had more substantial change and added quite a few new or improved features for players. New Horizons moved even further beyond and created its own identity while still being a solid Animal Crossing title at its core. But in some ways, I also feel that the game starts to drift away from the rest of the series. But what caused people to stop playing? Well, I could go with the easy answer and say... This thing. But I have other theories as well. 
In the past, one of the most interesting aspects of the game was, of course, your fellow villagers. But this time around, a lot of players were less invested in their animal neighbors than previous titles, because they realized they could use the Mystery Island visits to handpick their entire population. And a lot of players would straight up tell you that they're picking villagers purely on aesthetic. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, because people are naturally going to enjoy some character designs or villager personality types more than others. But your island is going to be a much less interesting place to live if you know exactly what to expect from every character interaction. Especially because it feels like there's less variety in this game's villager interactions compared to previous entries. Now, the more you play, the more you realize that there is a lot of unique dialogue, and it can occasionally be novel or entertaining, but you really have to seek a lot of it out. And beyond a select few villagers who always have something funny to say, I never find myself going out of my way to talk to any of them. Interacting with townsfolk and building relationships used to be one of the most compelling parts about Animal Crossing, and the personalities were so much stronger. Cranky villagers used to genuinely be cranky. They weren't afraid to give you the cold shoulder or tell you to bug off, but over time, they'd warm up to you. It made the characters actually feel like characters. Now, I do want to make it clear that I think the campsite and the mystery islands are good features. The ability to be selective about who resides on your exclusive tropical resort island makes sense, and veteran players like myself have the option to discover new characters or seek out our old favorites. But interactions with the residents are so basic and monotonous that you fail to make connections with any of them, and the game just feels like it's about designing things rather than living in a community. Their personality traits don't mean nearly as much as they used to, if anything at all. You no longer make friends or learn to get along with the ones who are snooty or stuck up. Now you're curating this collection of colorful animal dolls that walk and talk. And it's disappointing because they made sure to add a lot of personality to the villagers in their actions. Like, you can often see them around living their lives outside of you. Sitting out on their porch, working out, singing in the plaza, crafting DIY recipes, running, playing, sleeping, catching fish, catching bugs, talking to each other, and participating in island-wide events. Or at least dressing like it. Plus, villagers will sometimes want to do things like hanging out with you in your house. They'll have different dialogue about all the different types of furniture in your home, and even interact with certain things like rolling a die on a board game, or singing along with music that you have playing. I appreciate the depth and detail that went into stuff like this, as well as the many different hobbies that could be assigned to each villager. And to be fair, there are plenty of unique interactions you can have with villagers in their homes, out shopping, or during certain town events. But the majority of interactions with villagers will be when the player is outdoors doing various tasks like fishing and fossil hunting, and these are where the interactions feel the most lacking. So much so that they made Talk to Three Neighbors a daily Nook Miles reward, because it is simply not interesting or rewarding enough for players to do without additional incentive. Although I will say, the lazy villager dialogue is still pretty good when they're not rambling on about bugs. One of the great things about New Leaf is that the public works projects you have to choose from were all suggested by residents of your town. And while that does limit your options to an extent, it feels like you're developing your town not just for you, but for everyone. I think something like that does so much to give the player a connection to the world. The vibe of New Horizons, on the other hand, is essentially you doing whatever you want, and also there's an elephant here. Part of the fallout from the player base of this game was due to an issue that Nintendo's having a lot right now, and that's about post-launch support. Animal Crossing New Horizons was supported with 12 free content updates over the year and a half after the game's release, with the final update, dubbed New Horizons 2.0, releasing in November of 2021. An argument I often saw online, when people were still talking about this game, was that Nintendo initially seemed as though they were going to support this game with tons of DLC and seasonal events. But like with most of Nintendo's modern releases, the DLC became less and less substantial until they just stopped adding new things altogether. These updates did add a lot in terms of holiday events and small gameplay elements, but many of the added features were things that fans felt should have been included in the game's initial release. Things like swimming, gyroids, permanent locations for vendors like Leaf and Kicks, and fan-favorite NPCs like Brewster, Tortimer, and Harriet, along with in-game events like fishing tourneys and fireworks shows. 
and despite the debacle of Zipper. Animal Crossing was supported in this way much longer than titles like the new Mario Strikers and Mario Golf, but that's only because New Horizons became, like, Japan's best-selling game ever. It's great that the game's developers worked to make sure all of this content eventually made it to New Horizons, but many fans were none too pleased that it took nearly two years for Brewster and Cap'n to make an appearance, among other things. There's one other huge change that might seem small at first, but ends up having a huge impact on player experience. And that's the fact that all of your tools are now breakable. In theory, it makes a ton of sense that your hastily cobbled together axe, shovel, fishing pole, net, slingshot, and even watering can would wear down and break after too much use. And having DIY recipes to make new ones fits in well with the new crafting mechanic being central to the gameplay. But man is it such a slog in practice. It feels like a very unnecessary inconvenience whenever you're in the middle of an important task and your tool breaks and you've got to go out of your way to gather branches, wood, and or iron to craft a new one. Free money? How is that going to help me? I just wanted rocks. And it's especially annoying that you have to craft the- <laughs> And it's especially annoying that you have to craft the crappy version of a tool before you're able to turn it into the sturdier version. You could just as easily have allowed the player to make the sturdy version right away if they had the extra piece of iron. Now if there was some sort of visual indication of damage for the tools, like the axe had in the old games, it would be a different story. Because then it becomes the player's responsibility to keep an eye on your tool's durability. This kind of seems like a no-brainer, especially because it was something they had thought of decades prior. It's surely ridiculous to expect players to keep track of exactly how many times they've used every tool they're holding, especially in between play sessions. Making damage visible on the tools themselves is the perfect solution to this issue, and I can't believe that it wasn't implemented in New Horizons. You can earn DIY recipes for golden tools in this game, which, if you don't know, are unbreakable versions of these core tools, but the requirements to access them are a bit extreme. It used to be that you just had to throw an axe into a fountain or bury a shovel in the ground, but now you gotta do things like shoot down 300 balloons? They're all such a time investment that they're honestly not worth it. Most players don't even realize that these golden tools exist. I didn't know they were in this game until I looked it up about six minutes ago. Uh, I'm sorry? What's that? The golden tools break now? All this to say, breakable tools are really only a hindrance and make the game less desirable to return to. As the game hinted at the existence of golden tools and gave more realistic requirements for acquiring them, they wouldn't be such a turnoff. But as it stands, they don't provide any interesting challenge and the only thing they do is break the flow of gameplay. Honestly, the golden tools in this game seem kind of useless because by the time you unlock them, you'll probably have accomplished everything you wanted to accomplish. And also, they still break. My hope for the next title is that they won't make the tools breakable again, but they also keep the ability to buy different styles and colors of each tool, because I love the customization options and designs, and it would be a fun thing for people to collect if they so choose. I definitely feel like I should talk about terraforming in this game, since it was like, the big new feature. Honestly though, I'm not really sure what to say. I mean sure, I played around with it my fair share, and I made some stuff I thought was kind of fun. It was a bit more limited than I thought it would be, although it makes sense because it's gotta be digestible and easy for anybody to understand. But uh, I don't know, I guess it's just not for everyone. I'd also like to note how a lot of players, myself included, had problems with how the paths work in this game. Obviously it's a great idea, and they can look really good on their own, but they just don't flow well next to other paths, or buildings, or staircases, or slants, or basically any other surface. And uh, it's something to improve on for next time, I suppose. By the way, what exactly is the point of cooking? And I understand that you could ask this about many things in the game, like what's the point of collecting and customizing furniture? It doesn't really do anything. But like, cooking just feels like something that's in the game for the sake of being there. It's very similar in function to crafting DIY recipes, except that the DIY items you make usually have some sort of purpose. It doesn't give you a new mechanic, it works exactly the same as regular crafting, right down to the way you obtain recipes. Am I missing something? Is the food just supposed to be stuff that you can display in your home? Is it just another category of tasks to complete and items to collect? 
They also added the ability to plant vegetables in the game, which I guess goes along with cooking. Maybe Nintendo realized that a lot of their Animal Crossing fans are also into farming sim type games, like Stardew Valley. But this isn't really a comparable experience. But truthfully, I'm not surprised to learn that this forgettable feature didn't excite most players. It's a neat idea to introduce to the Animal Crossing franchise, and I'm positive that some people really liked it. But it's hard to imagine tons of players tripping over themselves in a rush to make sea bass pie and potato pottage. Perhaps it will be expanded upon in the future of the series, and they could probably find some interesting uses for it. So, is Animal Crossing New Horizons a worthy entry into the series? Yeah, it is. We could talk on and on about the differences between New Horizons and the rest of the series before it, but at the end of the day, it's a very good game in its own right. Whether you're an old fan or new, it hooks you in and makes you want to come back every day, find something new, and explore every creative possibility. It may not feel exactly the same as its predecessors, but it still has lots of charm and is still distinctly, unmistakably Animal Crossing. Do I think it's as captivating and impactful as New Leaf? Not really, no. But there is a whole lot to love about New Horizons. It added novel and interesting new elements to the classic formula, while expanding upon existing features and making some quality of life improvements. And I might still prefer some of the previous entries in the series, but it still feels like there's plenty to do in this game. Despite the familiar gameplay loop, I was rarely ever bored while playing it. But whenever the next title comes out, I'd really like to see more focus put on the villagers again. Their personalities and involvement with town events just give the game so much charm and it feels like such a big element missing from New Horizons. By the way, can we change the way we acquire art pieces? Cause I'm kinda getting sick of red shit. Most of the new features and enhanced customization options are excellent additions to the series. But so much of this game feels like you're just grinding for bells and nook miles and designing and changing and building, and you don't ever take the time to enjoy being in the world that you've helped create. And that's part of why people dropped off so hard from this game. They made the island look how they envisioned it, and then all the motivation to continue playing simply wasn't there. New Horizons isn't a life sim game, it's not about a community, it's a game about designing. But now that I think about it, people sharing their towns, their creations, and their experiences did help to form communities among players. And even though they were largely online, there were connections between real people. And in 2020 and the years following, that was something special. But the golden tool still breaks, so it gets a 2 out of 10.